Good morning, everyone. God bless you. I think we are going on a bit early. I'm just making sure that I'm on YouTube and Facebook at the same time. This is my second day of simulcasting, so we'll give everybody a few minutes to uh, get on. And let's see. Okay. Um, looks like it's working. I can see that I'm on YouTube. And hopefully I'm on Facebook. It looks like I am. I hope I am. We shall see here in one second. Let's see if I can make sure. Okay. Let's see. Just making sure we get everything going here. All right. Looks like we're good. Yep. Looks like we're broadcasting. So, praise God. Yeah. I think we are. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. Praise God. I don't. I, I hope that's my face, Facebook broadcast. I'm trying to see if I can find the comments on here so that I can. Uh, okay. Let's see. Hmm. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. What's this do for me here? Praise the Lord. I can't tell who's on yet if we are on. But let me just see by doing this. Let's see if I can do it this way. Let's see. Okay, let's see. Mm -hmm. I got that. I don't know if I can see comments yet. Okay. Comments? Oh, yeah, good. There we go. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> I'm slowly figuring this out. Thank you for your patience. That's why I got on just a couple minutes early so I could be ready for 10 o'clock. But it looks like everything's working today. At least it looks that way. Yeah. Okay, Patricia's on. Good morning, Patricia. And Ruby, God bless you. You're on Facebook. I hope you're able to watch us on YouTube, too. And uh, I'm excited about being on YouTube and and being able to record there. And uh, so that's a real blessing. So I'll be looking over to the left a little bit. You'll see my head so that I can see the comments. As, I don't know how to get them to stay up. How do I get them to stay up there? That's the question. Hmm. Not sure, but that's all right. I'll be looking over to them when I can so that I can see everybody's comments and maybe answer questions along the way as we are. But what a blessing it is to be with you this morning. Thank you for joining the broadcast of... of oops, let me get my camera set straight here. Looks like it's a little crooked. Yeah, it is a little crooked, isn't it? There we go. Come on, camera. Okay. All right. Well, anyways, it's a blessing to be with you. I look so forward to being with you each day. This is the last uh, broadcast for, the, um, for this week. And uh, we're winding down on this particular series. I feel like God is dropping uh, like the next step after this in my spirit so that we'll probably continue with the broadcast. I'm not sure times and stuff, but we'll, we'll see as we go along. But Lord, we just thank you this morning. We love you. We so appreciate you, Lord. We, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Oh, Lord. You said, taste and see that the Lord... You are good. Let us taste you today, Lord. Lord, we pray for your manifested presence that we would taste you, see you, hear you, feel you, be touched by you, and even smell your very aroma. Lord, I pray that you would make yourself known to us today in ways we've never known, that we'd see you like we never saw you before, we'd hear you like we'd never heard you before, Lord. We'd, we'd know you like we never knew you before. You said, blessed are the pure in heart, but they shall see God. Purify our hearts today, Lord, that we may see you as you want to be known. Lord, in John 15, you said, this is eternal life, that we might know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ, whom you sent. That's our prayer. We want to know you. Like with Moses, we pray, teach us your ways, O God, that we would know you. Open our eyes to see. Open our ears to hear. Open our hearts to receive understanding of who you are. 
And Lord, as we see who you are, that you would trust us to show us what you're doing upon the earth, what you desire for our lives, for our families, for our churches, for our ministries, for our city and for our nation, Lord. Lord, I pray today, Lord, you, you said, don't let this day come upon you unawares. And I'm believing you, Lord, that it won't. You said, the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night, but it won't be a thief in the night to your overcoming people because we're going to be prepared, positioned, propelled with your glory. So, Father, we just thank you today. We acknowledge you. We appreciate you. We just tell the Lord how much you appreciate him this morning. Let him know how much you love and appreciate him. Just take a moment with me and say, Lord, I love you and I appreciate you. I surrender to your working today. Whatever you need to do in my life, I give you permission to do it. We thank you for that today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. Good morning, Paula. Katie, thank you for joining this morning. It's such a blessing to be with you. Amen. And um, I'm learning how to do this simulcast. So thank you for your patience. And I'm learning how to be able to read my other screen here so I can see your comments. Amen. Good morning, Donna. Glad that you could join this morning. And she'll try to put in whatever she can to write in as I go along. Okay, I'm not sure about the, the YouTube, how to share it. That I know you can share Facebook. I don't know how you share YouTube uh, at the same time. I'm not sure how all that works. But I know face, Facebook, you can do a watch party live. And so I encourage you to do that from Facebook if you can, to do a watch party. And then um, also um, YouTube, I'm not sure you can share it while it's broadcasting. I'll, I'll find out. I'll try to get that information for you to see if that is possible. But anyways, it's just, an, it's just a blessing to be able to broadcast on both the YouTube and Facebook at the same time. I'm, I'm glad that uh, my son kind of figured it out. And I want to thank my my brother, Apostle David, that really encouraged me to to do it on YouTube. And so he's been reminding me very kindly every as often as he can get on YouTube. I said, okay. And I also want to give a shout out to Apostle Rick out in Texas as well. And he's really encouraged me to do these broadcasts. He was one of one that really pushed me. He said, you need to get on there and and share what God has given you. And plus, Reverend Lynn, my wife, when my kids have been saying, you need to do this and others have been encouraging me. And I, again, I reluctantly come on online. This is not something I wanted to do. I like writing, you know, because I just, that's, I don't know. I just feel like that's a natural gift that God's given me. This video stuff, this is beyond that gift. This is really relying on the Lord for me, if you know what I'm talking about. Number one, for technology. And secondly, you know, I had no desire to, to do broadcasts like this, none. You know, I just felt to write. I, the Lord gave me the hand of a ready writer. But I, but I guess now I got to write this way. <laughs> but anyways, I hope they were a blessing to you. Amen. And thank you for your patience as I'm learning how to do this and your and your love uh, to allowing me to have the grace to be able to do it. <laughs> Amen. Well, this morning, we're going to wrap up this week. And as I woke up this morning, you know, um, I woke up to some news with... It, Sad and joyful that my my daughter in law Patty's a mom friend who I've known for almost I don't know eleven twelve years now maybe more went home to be with the Lord and uh, man so many people that I know went home this year you know from from my mom to uh, to some 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 young people that we led to the Lord and discipled and my brother in law two brother in laws and it's been a it's been a year it's been a year for many of us but. In the midst of that, God is on the throne. In the midst of that, there's a change upon the earth. The, in, in the midst of that, God is perfecting a people, preparing a people for what's coming. And much is coming. Much is coming. So we need to be ready, beloved. We need to be ready. We need to be prepared, positioned, and propelled, equipped, enabled as full-grown sons and daughters of the Lord, as a wheel within a wheel, as a man-child company, as a bride with that four characteristics of the living creatures of maturity of, 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 uh, of they, they had four faces. And I shared this the other day, those four faces represent a divine relationship with the Lord in the spirit and on earth at the same time. They have a face number one of a man, which represents Adam and his ability to fellowship with the Lord that God made us to fellowship with him. Second, it has a face of an ox, which represents complete servanthood of the Lord an obedient heart that's willing to be that that love slave, that bond servant of the Lord. That's what the ox represents, that complete obedient servant of the Lord. Then it has a face of a of a lion, 
which represents power and authority, dominion, to be able to the rulership and reigning ship, dominion, uh, and to subdue the earth. That's the full grown nature of full grown sons. This is the four sided picture that God must bring in our life. And the last one was an eagle. It's got the face of an eagle. An eagle represents the ability to soar in the spirit, to live in the spirit realm, to live in the glory realm. All four of those, the man, the eagle, the ox, and the lion are the overcoming nature that the Lord needs in our lives for his parousia, that parousia, the surrounding of the Lord to be able to inhabit us, fill us so that we can arise and shine and that the, for our light is come and the glory of the Lord can be seen upon us. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So that's why this is really critical. We are in a critical time. I've been sharing with my brothers in Christ, even apostles, prophets, and pastors, that this time right now is not about going to do more work, going forward in the church age understanding and trying to build the kingdom in the church age understanding. This is a time we must wait on the Lord. And it's the exact opposite. It's not about doing, it's about becoming. Why? Because there's a preparation that's needed and needed that, that's so critical to, to, to the Lord. You know, I, I said this before you, to enter into the church wineskin, it's a message of salvation, but to enter into the kingdom wineskin, it's a message of preparation. And preparation means to, you know, we enter into the rest of the Lord, the seventh day, Sabbath day, rest of the Lord, and we cease from our own efforts. And the Lord is really trying to work that in our lives. How many know what I'm talking about? Where we don't try to do things for the Lord or live for the Lord. We give up that right to try to do and we wait and we rest. Waiting doesn't mean doing nothing. Waiting means listening, being empowered being strengthened, that, 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 that waiting upon the Lord is to be able to drink the new wine of the kingdom age. As we drink that new wine of the kingdom age, God is going to show us what we need to do. Come up here so I can show you what things are to come to prepare us, position us, so that this day does not come upon us unawares. Right now, one of the reasons why the Lord allowed a full stop back in March where we couldn't even go to our church buildings. We couldn't go, everything came to a dead stop. And there was a reason for that dead stop. And that was so that we, so that we would stop doing and we would start becoming. This new wineskin is what we're becoming. We're becoming, we, we have a choice to be a vessel, an, a, an ignoble vessel or a noble vessel, a vessel of honor or not. And right now the Lord is trying to position us to rule and reign with him. And to be able to rule and reign, it requires a changing of the guard, a changing of the clothing, a changing of what we wear, a changing of our spiritual garments. And in Revelation 19, 7, it says, a bride has made herself ready. And she was permitted, see, she was permitted to wear that new clothes. Joshua, the high priest in Zechariah 3, gets a new clothing. The old clothing has to be removed because he's in a new position to stand before the Lord in the glory realm. And he couldn't wear those filthy garments in the glory realm and neither can we. And so Revelation chapter one, two, and three is about the removing of those filthy garments and a positioning and lifting up out of the natural into the spirit and lifting up as an overcomer to be seated with the Lord on his throne as he overcame and sat down on his throne next to his father. It's Jesus sharing that overcoming victorious life in our life. Amen. That is so, that is so necessary. That's so necessary. And so that right now, it's, I, I know the, the pressure, there are people that need to hear the gospel, that, that need to preach the gospel. But in the church age, that's what we did. We advanced the gospel all throughout the world. And we did witnessings. We did witnessing. We witnessed of the gospel. But the, the problem is we never became a witness. We did witnessing. We preached the gospel. But the, but the message and the messenger did not become fully one. And that's what the kingdom age is all about, is to make the messenger of the gospel and the message one. Jesus was the example of the messenger and message being one. Paul was an example of the messenger and the message being one. John the Baptist was, a, uh, was an example of the messenger and message being one. So when they talked and when they preached, they had a spiritual substance, a quality of the spirit, a substance of the spirit that was life-changing earth changing. And they were, and, and just like Moses and Elijah were two end time deliverers and speaking on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus, their words were weighty. Their words were powerful. Their words were transformational. 
not just to change, not just to touch the surface of a man, but the words change the depths of a man. And that's what the kingdom of God does. It changes you not just on the surface, but it changes your innermost being. And that's really important that our innermost being in this day has to be changed outwardly and inwardly to become the new wineskin so that we can contain the new wine of God's kingdom. Because that new wine of God's kingdom comes with instructions. It comes with blueprints. It comes with understanding. It comes with wisdom to understand and discern. And the most important part that I shared with you is that tribe of Issachar anointing, you must understand the times and season we are in. Because if you don't understand the times and seasons, you're going to continue to go forward with your life as it's always been. And that's the problem that's happening with many of the church leaders. When And today, when the Lord wanted, caused everything to stop, it wasn't so that we could go back to doing what we're doing. He just didn't give us a time out so we could just stay home and spend more time with our families and do that. No, it was a time to reflect. It was a time to repent. It was a time to change. It was a time to say, God, why have you allowed this? Why can't we go out and do all the stuff we were doing? Because I believe at that point, this was a great test for many leaders in the body of Christ, whether they're going to go forward in the church age or whether they're going to come up into the kingdom age and begin to walk in a new place in the Lord. And to walk in that new place, you have to cease from your works. You have to cease from your efforts for strive diligently to enter into that rest of God, Hebrews says, Hebrews chapter four says, and to say, he that enters that rest ceases from his own efforts. You see, it's in the church age, we are we try to build the kingdom of God and do what God told us in our efforts and oftentimes mixed with flesh and spirit. And that's why it's lukewarm. It's a mixture of flesh and spirit. That system of flesh and spirit, if you don't change now, repent, it's going to be given over to the world system if we don't change our heart and mind. Because that flesh and spirit mixture, if it doesn't refuse, it doesn't change. It's going to have to come under the the one world religious system eventually here. And that's the danger for so, so many leaders today is we don't realize that that mixture cannot enter the kingdom of God age. And if you want to keep the mixture, you're going to end up probably on the wrong side of the picture here. Who is on the Lord's side? And we see that. You, because you're going to want it, you're going to be like Judas of Iscariot. I'm not saying you're being a Judas, but one of the reasons why Judas betrayed the Lord was the fact that he tried to pressure Jesus into taking the kingdom into his own hands. He figured if he sold them that Jesus would show his power and glory and overthrow the Roman government, but he didn't. And then later on, G Judas realized what he did and he killed himself. Why? Because he tried to force God's hand to do something. He thought God, the, the, his understanding of who Jesus was as a savior. And that's what's going to happen with the mixture of the flesh and spirit. So much the, that with that mixture, that mixture that produces a heart of pride and arrogance that says you are rich and in need of nothing. And the Lord says your true state is poor, blind, and naked. We can't continue with the mixture of flesh and spirit in the kingdom age. We can't and try to build God's kingdom. Eventually what's gonna happen is you're gonna get very frustrated like Cain because the Lord's not gonna accept that, 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 that a sacrifice. And that's when that religious spirit rose up in Cain and he saw that his brother's sacrifice was accepted, his wasn't, and what happened? He got angry. And what did the Lord say to Cain? Why are you angry? Don't you realize sin is lurching at your door? If you bring to me what I ask you to bring to me, won't you be accepted? But Cain saw the Lord rejecting him. Why? Because he didn't accept his sweat. Boy, what a word. He didn't accept his sweat. He wanted to bring the Lord the best of what he thought, of what he worked, of his own hands. And today, many ministers are bringing that same exact thing to, to the Lord. They're bringing their sweat. And that sweat is flesh. And that sweat can't enter into the glory. No flesh can glory in his sight. So there can be no sweat. The priests had to put off their wool garments and put on linen garments lest they sweat in that holy of holies and die. But you see, because the enemy has come with a system, a, a, a worldly success system, and 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 as 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 misinterpreted that scripture that we want to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. We think well done means much done. And so that's why I know your works and I know they're more numerous in the beginning. Jesus says, I see all that you're doing, but, but he rebukes them. And he says, but nevertheless, I have this one thing against you. You've deserted me. You've abandoned the love, the relationship you were supposed to have with me. You deserted me to do more work for me. And he says, I want you to consider the heights. Listen to that word from where you've, from where you've, 
from where you've fallen in Revelation chapter two, the heights from where you've fallen. And I want you to repent and do your first work or else, there's an or else there. I'm gonna come and remove my candlestick from your, from, from your presence. You know what that means? That means I'm gonna take my presence from you. And what happens when God removes his presence? Ichabod, the glory of the Lord departed. That is a real warning to leaders and to apostles and pastors and teachers that if we don't return to our first love and we want to continue to measure success by how much we do for God, that false ministry idolatry, then we're going to build a Babel. That part of the Babylonian religious system has to get out of every single believer in us because what it does is it relies you begin to try to earn God's love. You begin to try to earn your place into heaven. You don't do it with your mind, but in your heart, you have to prove your ministry. Now, I understand we're supposed to prove our ministry, but not prove it in man's understanding and man's wisdom and man's hands. He that enters into God's rest ceases from his own efforts. In the church age, it's a mixture of our efforts and God's efforts. That's why we can't, that's why we're not ready to drink the new wine or become a new wineskin, because as long as we want to use these hands to build, these feet to build, as long as that let us make bricks is still within us, let us build a wall, let us build a city. See that counterfeit let us? Let us build a city. Let us build a tower that reaches into heaven. Let us build a name for ourselves. That's that's Genesis chapter 11. That let us is a counterfeit anointing. It's a counterfeit. It, it's trying to do the work of God, the work that God wants us to do in our own power and our own strength. And God says, they'll be able to do it if I don't come, come and confound their language. That's a pretty heavy word. And so when the time came, and this is a difference between the church age and the kingdom age, Cain represents the best of the church age. He brings an offering to God. And what was he? He was a tiller of the ground. And do you understand? In other words, he was a farmer. It was a lot of work to plant seed, to take care of it, to produce crops, to make sure the animals did it. It was sweat. It was hard work. And somehow Cain believed that the job that God gave him was so important that the fruit of that work would be something that would please God. This is what Cain did. He took ownership over the work. When we take ownership over our lives, when we take ownership over our, our, our ministries, we replace the Lord. Or at best, we become mixed with the Lord. We become equal with the Lord so that we look at what we do for the Lord as being something that would be pleasing to God. And when that happens, beloved, it becomes your righteousness instead of the Lord's. It's very easy to do. It's very easy to do. I did it. I remember one time, you know, you know, I, 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 where I was upset with the Lord. I was upset with him because I watched all the other ministers that they were being blessed and I was suffering like crazy. We didn't have two nickels to rub together and they're getting big buildings and stuff. And I'm preaching the truth. People from their churches were coming to our churches to hear a word of the Lord. They wouldn't, they wouldn't even sow a penny. You know, they would give their tithe and offerings to the, to, to, to where they were going and they would come. They receive healing and they say, thank you. And man, God has set me free. They wouldn't even put an offering. And I was looking at that back then in the early days of ministries, you know, and I was complaining to the Lord. I said, God, I, I Lord, you're the one touching them. But Lord, they can't even sew a penny. And Lord, where they're going, they can't get what they want. They got to come here. And I said, Lord, this is not fair. Have you ever said that with the Lord? I said, this is not fair. I said, Lord, I'm preaching. I'm doing everything you've asked me to do. Lord, and Lord, whether they give or whether they don't give, it's not the issue. But Lord, why is this so? Why am I struggling so? And everybody else is being blessed. And then they're not even doing what you asked them to do. You know what I expected? I expected, oh, Henry, you poor thing. <laughs> I feel so sorry for you. You ever been there? I said, oh, my goodness. I said, Lord, I'm so sorry. I, I, I expected, Henry, I understand. I love you. No, nope. that's not what I said. That's not what he said. I stood there. I was upset. I was actually crying because I was, you know, because I, I mean, I had bills to pay. I had to learn that, you know, that was going to be a way of life for the rest of my life. I had to learn that, all right, God, I got to trust you every day for your provision, especially being missionary. 
especially when God told me in Matthew chapter 10 not to go to the Gentiles, but go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And don't take any gold or silver with you. Don't take a money bag with you. But, you know, he, he said, just go. And whoever welcomes you, stay there. He said, the workman is worthy of their wages. That, that's a tough one. Just go and just trust the Lord. <laughs> That's why people said, better than Henry, you should, maybe you should start a church because at least if you started a church, you know, you'd have people who would give tithing offerings and you'd have finances coming in. Now, I pastored like that for years. And so I know that, you know, that doesn't always guarantee that as well. But, but if I would just to start a church just so that I could get revenue, do you think that would be pleasing to the Lord? I don't because my motive wouldn't be right. I would be discipling people. Why? So that they can give tithing offerings so I can do the work of the Lord. I'm not touching that. I won't touch it. I'd rather struggle <laughs> than, than, than to do something out of a wrong heart and a wrong reason. But anyways, I was, I was saying to the Lord, Lord, you know, you know, I, 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 you know, please, you know, I thought the Lord would come and said, I understand, Henry, I'll strengthen you. No, you know what he said to me? Henry, your righteousness is but a filthy rag. I was so upset. Oh my God, I was so, I felt that in that moment, I was like Cain, I was angry with the Lord. I said, how can you say this is my righteousness? I did everything you asked me to do. And see, that's exactly what Cain did. Cain, when Cain brought his offering, I, Lord, you told me to be a tiller ground. I brought you the very best of my offering and now you're rejecting it? You're not receiving it? He was angry with the Lord. And then he looked over at his brother, Abel. What did Abel do? He was a keeper of the sheep. Well, that's a much easier job. You lead them to water, you lead them to green pasture, you watch them, you protect them, but it's a lot easier and a lot less sweat than what Cain did. And Cain was upset because his brother seemed to get off easier. And I was kind of saying that, you know, even though they weren't doing what they were supposed to do, I was, I don't know, jealous or whatever you want to call it at that time, not understanding the ways of God. I hate to admit that, but it's the truth. I was a very young minister and I needed quite a bit of adjustments. You know, that was over 30 something years ago. So I needed quite a bit of adjustments of the Lord. <laughs> Any of you go through those type of adjustments with your walk with God? Well, anyways, praise God. Um, um, I said, Lord, how is this my righteousness? He said, Henry, whenever you take what you're doing for me to justify yourself, it becomes your righteousness. And when we talk about the church age and the church age wineskin, many ministries are built upon that success that they have to prove to God they were faithful with their calling, but in the operation of the works of their hands instead of the works of the spirit. And only the Holy Spirit can show you that in your heart. He had to show me that that was in my heart. And I would have denied that was in my heart back, but if, if the Lord did rebuke me, I would say, no way, I'm doing this all for the Lord. And many ministers and faithful ministers are probably convinced that I'm doing this all for the Lord, not realizing they're doing it for themselves, that success, being needed, being accepted, being received, proving how many people you reach becomes... Um, you know, a heart attitude, a mixture that can't enter into the kingdom age. I think I told you the story about, you know, uh, when when they were trying to build a citywide church, the apostle, they were trying to establish an apostle in the area and all the churches were to come together, you know, and fellowship together and work together in unity. But every time I went in to this gathering, the, the lead apostle would come up to me and ask me this one question, how many are you running? That means how many people do you have in your church? And they were teaching back then, back in the 80s, that unless the 90s, unless you had 200 people in your church, you weren't a real pastor. You were just a cell group leader. I've shared that testimony. Why ask me how many I'm running? What does it matter? And it bothered me. And I told you for months, I would, I would, I would go into the bathroom and pray in tongues. I would hide so that he wouldn't come up to me, but he would find me every single time I was there. And I'm sure he asked this of everyone, you know? And so... I said, I, one day I, I got in that bathroom. I said, Lord, I cannot take this anymore. I can't keep coming, Lord. How do I answer this man? Lord, what do you want me to say to him? And so finally God gave me an answer. And I came in late that day. 
And sure enough, as soon as the break came, he said, Brother Henry, so good to see you. Matter of fact, he recognized the prophetic gift on me. He wanted to make me like the regional prophet along with him. I, and, the, and he offered me an office in his building. And I said, no. <laughs> the Lord said, you take that, you lose me. I said, okay, Lord, I'm not doing that. <laughs> but anyways, uh, so he finally came up to me. And he said, Brother Henry, how you doing? How many are you running? And I answered him, as many as God gave me. I have no idea what that number is. I can't count them. Do you know what happened to David when he counted Israel? God judged him. So I will not count how many people I have. And he, he went Whoa, like that. And he said, oh, okay. And he never asked me that question again. See, God has a wisdom. I would have never seen my plea to the Lord to provide for me because of what I had done for the Lord. Have you ever done that? Have you ever had that happen? That's the mixture of flesh and spirit. We wanna be justified before the Lord, argue with the Lord, because look at what I've done for you. That offering is an offering of sweat and it can never enter into the glory of the Lord. And much of the church age has been a mixture of that flesh and spirit, of sweat and spirit. And God caused everything to stop in March to stop us from continuing going in that direction. But unfortunately, at this point, many leaders and even Bible ministries want to continue to go forward instead of going up. Going up removes the work of the flesh because you can't, that flesh can't glory in the Lord's sight. Going up removes those filthy garments of that flesh and spirit. Going up causes us to get new royal garments and a new turban upon our heads so that we can walk with the Lord in the spirit, you know, where no flesh glories in his sights. So we've decreased and he increases so that we can hear and receive all that the Lord has from us. And it takes a great humility to be able to, to walk before the Lord. That's why who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? When John turned around to see Jesus as the king of glory, he fell on his face like a dead man. That's the position, a dead man. <laughs> and I needed to get dead back then and I still do. <laughs> You know, I hope you learned from my testimony not to make that same mistake. And God corrected me. But you want to know how beautiful God is? And not only did he correct me, chasten me, discipline me, but he came to build and plant. He said, Henry, let's get this straight. I'm going to provide for you for one reason and one reason only, because I absolutely love you. I lost it. I repented. I didn't realize that in his love was everything I would ever need, including my provision. And even though at that moment, you know, I was abasing and not abounding, God wanted to teach me that I'm your provider. So often in our walk with the Lord, I've got down to my last nickel, my last dime. Sometimes the Lord would say, share your need with a couple of people and let them know where you're at. Many times he doesn't. Many times he, he might share with me. But you know what? Whether I'm down to my last nickel or not makes no difference because I know his love will sustain me. I know his love will provide for me. I had to learn it. And it's because the Lord knew that the day would come that God would send me with nothing, with no gold, no silver, and be able to trust him with his provision. And we're about to be sent, beloved, by the Lord in a new dimension of glory. And in that glory, there is a transference of the, of, of the wealth of the wicked into the hands of the just. God has been working so many to transfer this wealth into their hands if he can trust them with it, if they will give it to him and allow him to show them every day what to do with those resources, he can trust them with it because they will use it with kingdom purposes not to build their ministries, not to build their lives, but they will recognize that God put this into their hands. What do you want me to do with it? Isn't that really the question of the heart condition that we need? God, what do you want me to do? Lord, what is your purposes? What is your plan? And so as we enter the kingdom age and receive the new wine, the parousia, all that information, all that strategies to be prepared, God is downloading now. If God were to bring a million dollars to you right now, what would he want you to do with it? Are you prepared for it? Would you know what God would want you to do with that? Would you say, oh, wow, this is so that I can go ahead and build all this. I can build a new building and do this. What if God says, I want you to take 999,000 uh, of that 
and give it to someone? Would you be able to hear that with the Lord? Would you recognize that it's not your own? Everything that we have belongs to the Lord. In this hour, the Lord is telling us to bring our Isaacs up to that mountain of our ministries, of our lives, of our families as we've known them to be, and to draw that knife out and to, and, and if necessary, put it to death. I can't even imagine Abraham for three days going up that mountain saying, God, this is the son, the son of promise. This is what you took, gave me. It's right here. But that, that blessing, that ministry, that son, whatever it is, began to grow equal in Abraham's heart and love and affection to the Lord. And the Lord had to make an adjustment in Abraham's life. He had to put Isaac back. You can never let the blessing of the Lord take the place of the blesser. And that's what we've done in the church age. We have, we have, we, we stopped seeking the Lord with the blessings. We stopped seeking the Lord when we got the anointing. We stopped seeking the Lord when our churches got built and we began to please men before God. We, we, we want, we want the blessings of God to reach more men and we forgot the blesser. We forgot the one who gave those things. We deserted him. We abandoned him as our first love. And so there has to be a, a there has to be a change. There has to be a, a transformation, a, a, a renewing, a getting back to where we belong. And that's what this year has been all about, to prepare us and position us. That's why I said that the enter, the enter the church age wineskin, it's a message of salvation, but to enter the kingdom wineskin, it's a message of preparation. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. I had to get that adjustment very early. Amen. It's not been easy. And I'm sure it's not been easy for you. You're probably going through a lot of suffering as a five-bone minister, if you're watching, or just, you know, or, or and just, just us as being saints. There's many are called, but few will pay the price to be chosen. God has to re remove that and fleshly let us out of us. Let us make bricks. Every human effort, strength has to be emptied to enter into the kingdom age. Every part of us that wants to build something, that wants to succeed in the flesh, that wants to produce something in the flesh must be removed. And that's the glory that the Lord's doing by meeting us in the air in the second heaven. He's removing that need to be needed, that need for success, that need to have our identity in anything other than Christ. If your identity is in working for Christ, it has to be removed. My identity is not in what I do. My identity is in him. In him, I live and move and have my being. My identity is not in anything, and it cannot be in anything other than being in Christ, and Christ in me, the hope of glory. He has to be seen in my life. He has to be seen in your life. His glory has to be revealed in you, not our glory and his glory mixed. Does that make sense this morning? That's why this is such a critical time, why we have to stop working because if we keep working and going, trying to go forward instead of up, we'll never be finished. We'll never be completed. We'll never be changed. We can never be formed into a kingdom of kings and priests to the Lord that know how to minister to him, rule with him, reign with him. We'll never be able to know what, what the Lord desires and we won't be able to know what's about to come on the earth because we're going forward instead of upward. And so as we finish this week, it's an upward call because it's an upward journey. The church age has ended. The church age is, is on the horizontal plane. And Jesus is here at the end of the church age and he's standing and he's knocking on the door of every man's heart to see who will hear his voice and open the door and let him come in. Because if we were here and we come into him like this, then what's going to happen? Then we're going to be lifted up in the spirit. We're going to change our position from the horizontal to the vertical. And from this vertical position, we're going to be able to meet the Lord in the air so that the third day miracle of being changed from water to wine can come and complete us. And so instead of being yielded vessels, we become completed vessels. Instead of trying to do the work of God, trying to live for God, we, we, be, we become the will of God. We, we, we work with the Lord. We live with the Lord. We become one with the Lord and function and purpose and in destiny. And now we're positioned to come up. We're positioned to go up through that door open in heaven in Revelation chapter 4, 1 and behold that glory realm. Experience that glory realm of those living creatures 
who can now identify with us because they have our four faces in them. The mature, the mature full-grown sons of God. Now that represents we can function with the inhabitants of heaven in the glory realm. As they move within the earth, we can move in the exact same manner on the earth as a wheel within a wheel. Because in this time of waiting, now Isaiah 40 becomes so real within us. They that wait upon the Lord. That doesn't mean you're doing nothing. It means you're waiting, looking to the Lord, being lifted up. They that wait upon the Lord, expect the Lord. As if he were to walk through that door any moment right now in fellowship with you. That's the heart. When I go in my alone time, I'm waiting for the Lord. I'm expecting him to come and fellowship with me and lift me up out of the natural into the spirit realm. Because in the spirit, you can see, you can hear, you can have understanding. God gives you revelation. He gives you understanding. He gives you timing. He gives you delivery. He gives you the information and instructions and blueprints, empowerment from that heavenly place and that heavenly realm that causes you and allows you to function and, and on the earth so that he can teach you and instruct you in the ways that you can go and he can guide you with his own eye. Praise the Lord but it requires a change, a repentance, and an overcoming to walk into the glory realm, to drink the glory of the new wine. The new wine comes with the revelation of the king of glory. The new wine comes with the, the voice of that king of glory. That's a war trump, trumpet. It's not the same voice we've heard in the church age. It's the omega voice. It's the voice of the Alpha and the Omega, Omega God. It's the voice that said, let there be light and there was. This is a voice we are now being trained by. This is a voice we are now becoming one with. This is a voice that's now speaking as lightning in the depth of our being. Lightning represents power. And that power as the, the Lord releases within us this new wine. This from his software, from his understanding and wisdom, where we will be able to function with him in his end time purposes in the power of that very word that's lightning as thunder. The thunder is the sound of God's word. The lightning is the power of God's word. The, the thunder is the sound of God's word. And that sound and power of God's word is what transforms the earth. It has power and it has sound. And that's why I turned around to see that voice speaking to me like a war trumpet because he was surrounded in the perusia of the Lord. That same one trumpet voice said, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the first and the last. When, when Moses was standing in the perusia of the Lord on the, it, it, where that burning bush was, he said, Lord, what? who should I say send me? He says, I am. Tell him I am that I am. That's exactly the parousia. That word parousia is in that word, I am that I am. And when Jesus said, I am the first and the last, that's the same parousia that he's revealing to John. And he's showing John how he's gonna finish and complete us. And so in this time, this is what we should be seeking. This is where we should be going, upward, not forward. That doesn't mean as we go upward, God will not use us. That doesn't mean that people won't be saved or God won't send you to pray with people or to minister to people or to feed people. It doesn't mean that he won't continue to do those things. It just means you're not doing those things first with mixture. It means now you're being in, you're coming under a deeper submission to the authority and the headship of Jesus. You're coming under his complete headship as the king of kings and Lord of life. It's in this place that Jesus truly becomes the Lord Jesus Christ in reality to you because now you're not going to do anything without him. You're not even going to think about it. <laughs> you're not even going to try it. That means the Lord is setting his boundaries within your heart so you dare not move. As that voice comes to me, I don't consider my own aim, my own thoughts, and my own purposes. I only consider, you know, I, you know, I, I have no desire to do my own aim or my own purposes, John chapter 5, verse 30. But my only purpose is to do the will of him who sent me. Isn't that glorious? That's what the parousia, the parousia, the surrounding does. That, that surrounding, part of this new wine of surrounding brings the boundaries of the Lord into your life. The boundaries that we need, why? Because this is where Psalm 32 verse eight becomes reality where I'm gonna teach you instructions in the ways that you should go. We need these boundaries. We need to know where our authority is and where it isn't. We, we don't take authority. I used to, to teach that because I was like, take your authority. And the Lord said, why are you teaching that? And I said, well, 
That's what I learned. He said, taking your authority, taking authority is stealing. You don't take authority, Henry. I give authority. Authority is earned. Authority is proven by, but authority is proven by your willingness to submit to God's authority over your own life, to the degree that I allowed the Lord Jesus Christ to have authority in my life, to come under his headship, is to the authority that I can operate in. If I'm not under his authority, and in every area I'm not under his authority, limits me in walking in his authority. And yet we teach people they can just go out and do everything because Jesus said so. But here's the thing. There is an anointing that comes upon you in the church age where you can do those works. But the gifts and callings of the Lord are without repentance. You can be as off as a million miles and still operate in the gifts of the Spirit. That's right. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in your name? Haven't we cast out devils in your name? Haven't we done all this in your name? And the Lord says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. So you can't base your your, your life on, on being used by the Lord or what you built for the Lord. Our identity is in Christ. Christ in us, the hope of glory. That's what needs to be seen. He's coming now to be glorified in his saints, to be glorified in his saints. His glory is to be seen upon you, risen upon you. And that comes in completed vessels that have now come under his complete headship as the Lord Jesus Christ. This new wine consists of that lordship. And for us to come under that lordship, there is a Revelation 2 and 3 teaches us that we need to, first of all, be able to see what the Lord sees and that there is still things that need to be removed for our lives. So we've got to change. We've got, we've got to repent and change and overcome. That's the requirements of entrance way upward. Repent, change, and overcome so that we can be positioned, prepared to be filled with the glory. In that glory realm, there are boundaries. There are glory realm from that boundaries. Ananias and Sapphira broke those boundaries. How did they break those boundaries? When everyone else was taking, selling their possessions and laying them at the apostles' feet, they gave the Lord all the proceeds. But Ananias and Sapphira weren't sure this new work was going to really catch on. So they sold their stuff, but they kept a little bit on the side for themselves in case things didn't work out. And they gave the rest to the Lord. But what they did was, when they did that, they broke the protocol. They broke the boundaries of glory. They lied to the Holy Spirit. Why? They made a provision for the flesh. They kept some for themselves. Oh boy, that's a word. Just gonna let that sit there for a minute. Just ponder that for a minute. In case things don't work out, they made provision for themselves. But that was a secret motive of their heart. The heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? That's why this time is critical. My daily prayer before the Lord is, Lord, search me, O God, and try me. Know my thoughts and see if there's any wicked way in me. I don't want to assume my heart is right. I don't want to assume that I'm right with the Lord. I want to know. I need God to show me. I want to stay within his boundaries. When you have that desire to stay within his boundaries, that's when his lordship, his authority and power and dominion can operate through your, law, your life because you don't want to use it wrongly. Moses learned those boundaries, but there came a point where he was so provoked with the people of God. By this time, they should have been able to trust the Lord. And he got so frustrated and they said to him again, Moses, you brought us out here to, to die. There's no water. And Moses got up so upset and the Lord had told him and gave him an instruction to speak to the rock and water would come out the second time. But Moses, out of that frustration, took his staff and he struck that rock and water came out. And when he did that, he came out of the boundaries of glory. What did he do? He went back to what he knew. The Lord brought water out of the rock the first time by striking him. He did not heed the present word and instruction of the Lord. For that moment, he went back in, call it the church age. This worked before. I know I, he did it. And the pressure that he felt caused him to make a compromise. 
And that was a costly compromise. Because of that, he wasn't able to enter the, into the land of promise. He was able to see it, but he wasn't able to enter in. Just a thought. I remember there was one time we were really, you know, our church at the time was going a, a call it a split, but it was more of something else. And um, I remember that um, it got so bad and I couldn't pay my light bill and my lights got turned off. And of course, this is way back in the early days. And my wife was very upset with me. I was upset with me and I was upset with God that why would that happen? I just didn't have the money to pay it. I tried to make arrangements. The arrangement didn't work. And so the lights got off. And, you know, we were both young. Donna and I were learning how to walk with this and she was not happy and that surely didn't make me happy. So I had a keyboard that I had that it was a, a, a Korg I3. And I was uh, going to go to the PAWN shop and get money for it and go pay my electric bill. It was quite high. It was two months at this particular time, I think. And we, you know, we I can't even explain to you. I wasn't trying to be negligent. I just didn't have it. And at that time, nobody would help me. And so I said, okay. I, I got my keyboard and I was I said, Lord, that's it. I'm going to take this. I'm going to go to the P-A-W-N shop and um, I'm spelling it because of my, of my New England accent and I don't want to say it wrongly. I, I'll say it will not, not sound right. So I'm spelling it for a reason. And so I took it. I got to the door and the Lord said to me, Henry, I just have one thing to say to you. I said, what's that, Lord? He said, remember Esau. You know what Esau did? He gave up his birthright for a bowl of soup. I was about to give up my birthright. This is how holy God is. This is how God does not want us to do things in the flesh. I would have broken the boundaries. As soon as I heard the Lord say, remember Esau, I turned right back, put the keyboard back down in my, my room. I said, Lord, it's in your hands. If we stay in the dark, we stay in the dark. I'm going to trust you to provide for me. About 30 minutes later, I get a phone call. And the sister in the Lord calls, Brother Henry, I, I, I need to come over to your house. Pastor Henry, I need to come over to your house. She's a part of our church. I said, uh, no, this is not really a good time right now. She goes, no, 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 I have to come. And I said, okay. I said, I, I said no, this is not a good time. No, please, I got you. I have something for you. I said, okay, come over. And I said, I told Donna, I said, and she's, <laughs> I said that Donna, they're coming. And of course, she was not happy about that. I said, well, I'll meet them at the door. I won't let them in the house. <laughs> so they won't see that the lights are off. I think I was probably saved a few years by this time and maybe three or four years and just having our church. And they come and knock at the door. And what do you know, right? She knocks at the door, she says, Oh, Pastor Henry, can I please use your bathroom? I just, I, before I get to talk, I said, Oh, God. I said, I said, sister, I'm so embarrassed. I said, I'm so sorry. You can use my bathroom, but my lights are off. I have no electricity. I, did, I, I just didn't have the money to pay it. And she says, oh, Pastor Henry, do you know why I'm here? I said, no, why are you here? She said, about a month ago, the Lord's, I had started a college class and I put a deposit down. And the Lord told me last week that he was gonna give me the deposit back, but I needed to give it to you. And that's why I'm here. And so she puts it, she gives it to me, right? And she goes and uses the bathroom and she says, I hope this is enough. So I didn't even look at what she gave me. Would you believe? Yeah, you would believe that what she gave me was exactly the amount that I needed for the electric bill. Look at God. Could you imagine if I had broken the protocol? Could you imagine about how serious God is about flesh and spirit? Can you begin to see that our success can never be based upon what we do? And that this perusia is God sounding, God surrounding, and in it there is a provision that God wants to bring to us. Isn't that awesome? Don and I both learned a lesson, and we learned like 30 years later how to trust him now. You know, it's still not easy. There's times we get to that that to that brink as missionaries, but Whatever that is, God is always right on time. But the lesson of this is a surrender. The lesson is that this new wineskin is a completed vessel that's totally the Lord that has to walk in faith and trust him. Amen. 
and I needed a readjustment in my heart. And that's what the Lord is doing in this time of Revelation chapter two and three. He wants to bring a finishing readjustment to remove Cain's heart from us so that we won't bring Cain an offering. And we know what happened when Cain, we know what Cain did. And this is what I'm afraid of with many in the church age, if they continue that way, is that that, that mixture cannot come into the kingdom. So it's got to go somewhere. So I believe it's going to get caught up in the world religious system. And that's really dangerous because it's that world religious system that's going to be like the Pharisees and Sadducees of Jesus day and persecute and come against and even try to kill and murder the genuine. Just as it did in the days of Jesus. That's why this is so important. That's why we got to stop Say, Lord, first of all, what are my motives? Why am I doing what am I doing? Is my success, my worth based on what I do for you? How many of you feel so guilty sometimes because you're not doing enough for the Lord? How come the church is always saying to us so much often, church leaders, that we're not doing enough? I used to say this because I was taught this. Those that come on Sunday morning, those are the religious Christian. Those that come on Sunday and Sunday morning, Sunday night, those, those are the ones that want a little bit more of God. But those that come Sunday night, Sunday morning and Wednesday, those are the true ones that God can work with. And all of a sudden we put a yoke, like somehow the more we do for God, the more that we earn from God. That's what has to be removed. That's the flesh. That's the flesh that wants to say, let us make bricks. Let us build a wall. Let us build a city. Let us build a tower that reaches up into heaven and let us build a name for ourselves. See, that's an identity crisis. It's a counterfeit. And that counterfeit spirit operates at, and it almost looks like a genuine anointing in people because it, it works in the power of charisma of the human soul, the human spirit, and it can do a lot of things. It can accomplish a lot of things. The Lord said there's nothing that they won't be able to accomplish in the power of charisma. That's why this is so important. That's why no flesh can glory in that sight of the Lord. The Lord wasn't about to accept my, my, my righteousness. You did this for me, Henry. You did what I told you to do. You can never use what I have given you to do to justify yourself before me. Your righteousness is but a filthy rag. This is why we're getting a new wine skin and why we're getting new wine. Now, I'm gonna go over to um, Psalm I want to look at Psalm 24. I'll close out the week with, with Psalm 24. I have a few minutes left to do this, but I just want to show you this process of the Lord, a preparation to receive the glory realm, the new wine and the new wine skin. The first thing in Psalm 24, it says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness of it, the world and they who dwell in it. Why is this an important part? Because it, it points us to that the earth is the Lord's. Ownership belongs to God, including us. And so the Lord is requiring us in this kingdom age to come under his complete headship and maturity as full-grown sons and daughters who understand the boundaries of the parousia, that surrounding is boundaries, are you with me? That surrounding is boundaries of where we're gonna function, so therefore, it requires me to listen. It requires me to hear. It requires me to understand the present work and movements of the Lord. What does God want today for me? He has a word for me today and it's greater than the word that he spoke to me yesterday. And it will be greater than the word he's gonna to speak to me tomorrow. So it causes me to walk with the Lord, upward with him, to go upward with him for the deeper revelation, understanding, information, strategies, and blueprints that I need because the earth is the Lord's. In other words, I come completely dependent upon the Lord in my thoughts, in my mind, my actions, and my deeds. And I begin to understand the boundaries of glory. The boundaries of glory are the parousia. Those boundaries were so, were so big that the Lord told Moses, take the shoes off of your feet for the place you're standing. He didn't stand in the bush, but he was near the bush. He said, the very place that you're standing is holy ground. And Moses had to learn the boundaries of the Lord and the operation of the Lord. It was on that mountain that he began to learn the operational boundaries of glory. You see, in the church age, there are very little boundaries 
ministers, people, all of us do whatever we want, whatever we think God wants, whenever we want God to do it. And there are things that God is telling us to do when we do that. We get it. That's the spirit part. But there's also parts where we're dictating, where we're doing, and we're doing, and we're building, and we're walking in the realm of human wisdom mixed with God's wisdom. In the kingdom age, it's just God's wisdom because there's only one will. There's no two wills. It's not my will and God's will. It's just God's will. The child of God is the will of God upon the earth. That's why solid food is mature. Is this helping anybody today? Is anybody still listening? <laughs> I hope so. Is this encouraging you this morning? Is it showing you that why do I feel such a restraint? Where, see, that, that restraint is exact opposite of what the church age is saying. Go, 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 go. Let's get back to work. Let's get back to doing. Hurrah, hurrah, hurrah. The kingdom people are feeling a restraint of the Lord, an operation of the Lord, a waiting on the Lord. They're getting prepared for the Lord. They're getting ready to move. I don't know how they know it, but they know it by the spirit of God that God, we're going to be moving with you. All those things are going to happen, but we're not doing it alone. We're not doing it apart from you. Like it says in your word, apart from me, you can do nothing. They don't want to do anything without the Lord. I said in the church age, it's me and the Lord. I work for God and I live for God. In the kingdom age, it's me and the Lord. The Lord and me and me and the Lord, we're one. That's the kingdom wineskin. That's where the kingdom wine can flow. I don't do anything without the Lord. I don't consult my own will and my own age. And we're all learning that. We're not there yet. Well, maybe some are further down the road than I am, but we're learning how to come in the boundaries of the parousia of that new wine because that operating system has boundaries. The flesh wants to go beyond those boundaries. And do whatever it wants. Isn't that the world system? Do whatever you want. Everything is okay. And that's why if you stay in the church age, even that system has to come into, I can do whatever I want. It will agree with, I can do whatever I want. As long as I can do what I want and what the Lord wants, it's going to agree with it. It's going to come under it. It will never come under the headship, the full grown headship of the Lord, because it can never come into maturity. but it will end up operating like the world religious system instead of the kingdom. Now, the Lord said that, you know, in that day, he's going to judge our lives. And it's either going to be precious metals or diamonds or wood, hay, and stubble on that day of Christ. Many are going to enter into the kingdom just escaping the fire. Their whole life will be wasted. Their whole ministry work may be wasted and burnt up because it was never of the Lord, never built on the Lord, or the Lord never built it. They'll come in and escape by the fire. They got, and they'll be crying, salvation, salvation. But the overcomers have a singing testimony. He has made us. He has formed us into a kingdom of kings and priests unto the Lord. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the currents and the rivers. Okay, once we recognize that the earth belongs to the Lord and we belong to the Lord, listen to the question, who can go up and go, who shall go up into the mountain of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? Revelation chapter two, verse three, the making of the new wine and the new wineskin. Why would the Lord put this as a question? Who shall go up into the mountain of the Lord? This is a kingdom message. This is a kingdom psalm. It speaks of the king. This is an end time prophetic psalm. This is powerful if you're getting this today. This is a really, I, I think God is really dealing with our hearts this morning, don't you? Dealing with our motives so that we can see in the kingdom that we would have a desire to come under his authority fully, body, soul, and spirit. Think about all the things we say, every idle word we speak, everything that we judge by our own eyesight, criticisms, when we go to the store, when we're driving, when we're in the supermarket. Look at all those things that we judge by the natural senses and the choices that we make and how they affect us, how they affect others. And the Lord's saying, you can't live there. You got to live within my boundaries. And my boundaries will cause you to see what I see, hear what I hear, 
It gives you a supernatural new eyesight, a supernatural new hearing, a new, a supernatural new understanding so that we, we are one with the Lord, so that we work together with the Lord. The Lord works together with us, with him as the leader, not us. It changes everything, beloved. It changes what we see. It changes what we do. It changes how we see our husbands, our wives, our children, our family, our finances, because we own nothing. Everything belongs to the Lord. We've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, we live, but not I, but Christ now lives in us. This is the kingdom reality. This is life in the kingdom. As we come under his complete headship, under his complete authority, where we learn his parousia, that new wine, that operation of the spirit of God that keeps us within the boundaries of his glory so that glory can be seen in us and upon us. Don't you want that? I know I do. Amen. This is such a kingdom psalm. And here's a question. Who shall go up to the mountain of the Lord? Because it's a choice. It doesn't say everyone goes up to the mountain. It says, who shall go up to the mountain of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? And here are the boundary requirements. This is what Revelation chapter two and three are here to do, to refine us. I said yesterday, this is the fulfillment of yesterday's teaching, Malachi chapter three, where the Lord says, I'm thoroughly gonna come to the sons of Levi and I'm gonna purify them like gold and like silver that they might bring unto me offerings of righteousness. There comes the time where Jesus is appearing in the second heaven right now as that refiner's fire and full of soap with feet like burning like an oven to complete us, to finish us. On the third day, I'm gonna finish my course I want to remove every spot, every wrinkle, every blush, and every wrong motive, blemish, every motive, every hurt, every wound. I'm going to remove it by fire. This is the day of fire. I'm going to remove it by the fire, the baptism of fire, and I'm going to perfect you. I'm going to mature you. I'm going to bring you to a place where I, where you can walk in my kingdom, power, authority, and, and take dominion over the earth because you're a people who are under my boundaries. You're a people under my canopy, as I say in chapter four, that my glory shall rest upon you and I'm going to lead you by the cloud of my day and the night by fire because you are my Perusia people. You are my people filled with glory. You've been prepared for glory. You've been positioned for glory. You understand the boundaries of glory and now you're going to move by the cloud by day and by the a fire by night. Now you're going to be moved with me as a wheel within a wheel connected with the living creatures that you're not going to go outside of your boundaries, outside of your parameters, outside of the Perusia of the Lord. You're going to live and dwell in that glory realm of the Lord. Praise God. What a good word this is this morning. Amen. I hope it's encouraging you. I'm going to wrap it up. I'm taking a couple extra minutes because this is Thursday and it's the end of the week. I hope that's okay with you. But there is a requirement. Repent and return to your first love and do your first work. Recognize you have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Strengthen what remains. You tolerate this prophetess Jezebel, remove her. Get rid of the doctrine of the Nicolaitans from your midst and get rid of your lukewarm heart. And if you will repent and change and overcome, then you'll be able to go up the mountain of the Lord. Notice the church age wants to go forward in this realm where God's kingdom age wants us to go up. Are you catching that with me today? Amen. So who can? Look at the requirement. He that has clean hands and a pure heart. Doesn't that make sense? How do you get clean hands and a pure heart? Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, who recognize their true need for God and repent. Theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn over their spiritual condition and break and fast and pray over where they are, but they shall be comforted. Right? And then it goes on. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Now, because of repentance, you're hungering after the kingdom of God and his righteousness, but they shall be filled. And then blessed are what? The pure in heart. And look at the reward for the pure in heart. They shall what? They shall see God. See, Jesus teaches us the principles of the kingdom. He can, he can come up the mountain of the Lord. He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted himself up. See, that's the Cain right there. That's the Babylonian system who hasn't lifted himself up to the falsehood or to what is false or what's counterfeit. And they're sworn deceitfully. 
Now, this is really powerful in verse five because this is where you begin. This is where um, uh, Psalm, excuse me, Proverbs 8, 21 comes into reality. To those that I love, I cause them to inherit riches, true riches, and I fill their treasuries. And who does he give it to? I love them that love me. And those that seek me diligently and earnestly shall find me. There's a reward. And look at what this reward is because as we're seeking the Lord, he's refining us like gold and silver so that we might bring what? Offerings of righteousness to the Lord. In other words, we're only doing exactly what the Lord told us to do. We're living. Jesus is now able to live his life of complete obedience in your life. And we become a temple of the Holy Spirit and we become the Lord's ambassadors. We become the full grown body of Christ connected to a full grown headship. And we begin to be, we begin to become the testimony of Jesus upon the earth. The spirit of prophecy now fills our mouths. Who can do that? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. He shall receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. He shall receive blessings, an inheritance, a substance. I talked about it yesterday, a spiritual substance. The kingdom age comes with a substance, a substance of God's glory, a substance of God's nature that is different than the presence and the power and the anointing that we knew in the church age. That power comes on us to do a work of the Lord and then we then it leaves and, we, and, and then we're just like we were with all the mixture. This is different. This is different. This is kingdom substance. They receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of their salvation. Who receives this? Look at verse six. This is the generation. And that's where we are in the right now. This is where we are. Of the generation, the description of those who will seek him. Remember, I love them that love me. And those who seek me early and diligently shall find me. In the church age, we don't seek the Lord. We seek the work of the Lord. We're not seeking the Lord for who he is and for just for him. We're seeking him for his work. We're seeking for him to work more for the Lord because that's what we think the goal is, working for the Lord instead of being one with the Lord. That's our destiny is the throne, being one with him. And so we seek the Lord for work, how to do the work, how to continue the work. But the Lord for him, loving him for who he is, worshiping him for who he is, takes the back seat. And so we never meet his needs first. We meet the needs of men first. And that's what I've been sharing with you. And let me wrap up with this. This is a generation of those who will seek him, who inquire of, for him, of their necessity, they require him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob, Selah. Think about that. That was the song God gave me the other day. I hope you heard it on the YouTube channel. Okay. It's called The Roar, Line of Judah Roar. The first interpretation of tongue I got in that song was Sila. Think about it, overcomers of God. Think about what the Lord is saying. This is a generation who seek him as their vital need, who seek your face. Notice this whole thing is about seeking the face of God, not the hand of God, not the work of God. This is a generation, and there is a generation, especially of young people, who are falling in love with Jesus just seeking his face. Those are the ones that are going to learn the boundaries, the instructions, the blueprints. They're going to drink the new wine because they're a new wineskin that's going to be able to function with the Lord with his end time purposes as a wheel within a wheel. And notice, they're the ones that come up to the mountain of the Lord. And what do they do on that mountain? Just like John did. Lift up your head, O ye gates, and lift up your heads, O you everlasting doorways, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The war trumpet, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord strong in battle. This psalm is a prophetic psalm of the kingdom age, of what we need to do, repent, change, overcome, to where we have clean hands and a pure heart of the overcomer so that we can be lifted up into the glory realm and receive the king of glory to take charge over our life. And in that, that parousia now establishes the boundaries of God's work in our life. And we don't go out of that boundaries so that we would never strike the rock when God says, speak to it. We don't want to get out of those boundaries. And right now he's teaching us how to get with those boundaries. And you can't learn that while you're working for the Lord. You have to learn that alone with the Lord so that you learn how the Lord works. I'm going to say that again. You don't learn that working for the Lord. You learn that alone with the Lord. And you and, and in that aloneness, you learn how the Lord works. 
that I may know how to speak a word in season. The Lord God has given me the tongue of the Lord that I might know how, right, to, to speak a word in season. Come and follow me and I shall make you to become fishes of men, that I will make you to become fishes of men. That's God's doing. He makes you to become. I'm making you, forming you. It's a kingdom of kings and priests unto our God. It's God's work. That's the kingdom wineskin and the kingdom wine that we need to drink and eat and live in so that we will be ready for what's coming, prepared for what's coming, so that this day does not come upon us unaware, so that we're prepared, positioned, propelled with God's glory, you know, battle ready, you know, as a new wine skin filled with a new wine to function with the Lord together with other believers and other saints as a full-grown, mature body of Christ. Jesus as our head, connected to a full-grown, multi-membered body of Christ. That's what God is doing in your life and my life if we let him. And it will cause a great change and we must repent. Fast and pray, repent, so that we can be what changed through repentance so that we can overcome. And as we overcome, we go up. You wanna go this way, you wanna go this, that way. Amen. Well, I hope this was helpful for you today. It sure helped me. Every day I share, I get to see it a little bit more clearer with you. I hope you are too. We're, see we're seeing the kingdom age, the kingdom reality, and we're experiencing it more and more, I pray through these broadcasts. Father, I thank you for this week. I thank you for my brothers and sisters who are watching this broadcast or will watch it. I pray such a release, such an impartation, a strengthening, an a quickening, an enabling of your spirit. Lord, that this word would not fall upon by the wayside and rocky ground, shallow ground, but this word would fall into good ground and produce even to a hundredfold. Let this word become our life experience. Let it become flesh within us. And I pray release, strengthening, enabling, quickening, Lord, of your spirit. Burn them in us, Lord. I pray such a release of your baptism of fire to refine us like gold and silver so that we would only bring you offerings of righteousness. Lord, that we would learn your boundaries, that we would learn the operation of your parousia, Lord. That we would understand the boundaries and stay within them, Lord, and come under your complete headship, under your complete lordship in our life, in our family, our loved ones, our spouses. That they would see you in us, Lord, and they too would desire to come under your covering, under your tent, and be beautified by the spirit and blast of burning and the spirit of blast of judgment to be perfected by your fire with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Lord, thank you for doing that work in our lives. Thank you for these broadcasts. Thank you for teaching us your ways. And that's our prayer. Teach us your ways, O oh Lord, that we might know you. And if we found favor in your sight, show us your glory. Lord, bless and strengthen your people. Strengthen them spiritually, physically, emotionally, relationship, financially, health, Lord. Strengthen us, Lord, and bring us forth as your overcoming ones, your bride, without spot, without blemish, your man-child company, your full-grown sons and daughters. Let us come into that divine placement with you in alignment with one another that you can form this wheel within a wheel upon the earth, Lord. We lay everything down at your feet, Lord, and we give you permission to change us, redirect us, realign us, reassign us. If we have to move physically to another state, change jobs, whatever it takes, Lord, we give you permission to do it. We, we hold on to nothing, Lord. You've called us out of the church age for a reason, and you're bringing us, us into the kingdom age, and we desire it, Lord. And now to you who can do exceedingly above all that we ask or think, to you be the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, that's it for this week. Amen. I hope it was a blessed week for you. I know it was for me. Um, join us Sunday for the gathering at 10 a.m. And we have a time of intimate worship. If you're a fivefold minister 
and you have the opportunity to join us, I know you may have services or watch the broadcast. What, what the Lord has me do is just be able to find him, minister to him in song and in worship. And he takes us up into that glory realm and speaks to us, reveals to us, changes us. And even though we're all in different places and different nations, God meets each one of us personally and collectively. And God begins to speak to all those that are watching and they begin to see and hear and we're built up and we're strengthened by it. So, but perhaps it might be a, a, you know, a tool that God could use to help even with your worship teams and your worship people to be able to, to come up higher and deeper in the Lord. That will be on Sunday at 10 a.m. So hopefully that you, all of you can join us. And, and with that, I look so forward to that time together in the Lord. Uh, thank you so much for all of you that are praying for us, encouraging us and sowing financially. This is a time and season of great need and we are really believing God trusting God for all of us. All of you have needs with Christmas coming and 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 so forth. And with people maybe not working and things shutting down in some states, we are praying that God would bring supernatural provision to each and every one of you. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for those of you that God has touched to sow. And I pray today, if God touches your heart uh, to, to, to sow into our work and you're watching this for the first time, uh, you know, um, our moderator hopefully will put on on here how to do that but if if not if she's not on today um all you have to do is is go to paypal and i'll just say it to you it's paypal.me slash all lowercase flame of fire one word uh, that's paypal.me slash flame of fire all lowercase one word and you can sow a seed to help donna and i live because that's how we live take care of our home and our resources where we where we are and and also able to go and I'm I'm hoping and praying my car is going to be fixed soon so I can get up to Pennsylvania so please keep keep that in prayer and we thank you for your precious seeds of finances we really need it and God knows that and we need his help <laughs> amen just like you do and so when God touches somebody like you what a blessing what a blessing when he touches someone to give because I know that's your livelihood that's your life and for God to do that that's a big deal and we take it that way and we thank you for that. We thank you for your obedience. No one has to give. No one's, this is free, okay? So if God doesn't tell you to, then don't do it. But to those of you that do, that hear the Lord's voice, thank you. And those of you that the Lord doesn't tell, that's fine too. We love you too. You know, you can only do what God tells you to do, right? But we appreciate your desire to do it at least. And if he tells you to, great. If he doesn't, great. But I thank you for that so much, especially this holiday time and all the stuff that's coming up. All of us, we need the Lord's provision. And like he told me, I'm gonna provide for you because I love you. And he does it by touching people just like you to be able to give, even sacrificially. I know that giving is a sacrifice to the Lord and know that God takes those seeds, he blesses, he multiplies them. And I pray that God would give you 12 baskets less over. If we can serve you in any way, help you, please email me at go at flameoffire2007.org. That's go at flameoffire2007.org. If we can pray for you, serve you, we are here for you. We are family, but we are becoming the army of the Lord. We love each and every one of you. Hope you can join us on Sunday, 10 o'clock for the, for the gathering. Have a blessed weekend, everyone. We love you. And may the blessings of the Lord make you rich and add no sorrow. Amen. Bye-bye now. Love you all.